here did sign the uh, attendance sheet, right? All right, before we get started, let's do some reminders. Uh, first one is Google Classroom. I'm glad someone already talked to me about that. Make sure you're on Google Classroom. If you're not, then make sure you see me after class today. So we go to my office really quickly and I have to make sure you're on it. Because today's lab is going to be found on Google Classroom. Well, there's a million reasons why you need to be on Google Classroom, but that's the big, right? The most is pressing reasons. So make sure you're on Google Classroom, make sure you need to you know how to use it. And again, if not, come with me after class, come to my office. I'll make it really quick if I need to. I know uh, time is important for you guys. Well, for me too. Um, another thing about Google Classroom, if you're already on it, you know this, I send out a really long message. They won't usually be that long, but that was the first one, so I had a lot of information to get to. Make sure you read that message. It obviously is a lot of important information, like how you can do independent work, how you can do labs, all that kind of stuff. Some of the easy ways you can do um, That was the other announcement, independent work. Again, it's not due, technically due until December 4th, but you should be working on it now. So today, as I'm teaching biology, try to think in the back of your mind, just think of some questions that you might come up with that aren't necessarily exactly what I'm talking about, but sort of related, and then go home and answer them. Right? Just look it up. You, you mentioned turtles, so I was wondering, you know, what causes the sex of, or what determines the sex of turtles? And according to this source, it is this reason, right? It's a really short paper if you want. Um, and then syllabus, before we get started, that's the last reminder. Remember, your first assignment is to read the syllabus. So technically, you should have already read it, read, read it, read it? You should have already read it. So that being said, do you guys have any questions about the syllabus now that we've gone over it on Monday and you've read it since then? Any questions? Nice and easy. All right, let me give this to you to sign in. And then we'll get started. Oh, yeah, the other reminder again, like I said on Monday, I've declared all Wednesdays from now on WBSU Wednesday. So for those of you wearing WBSU, you will get it. Instead of 2.4 points for attendance, you get 2.5. Um, and then at the end, if I can remember, if we have time, we get our picture taken together, everybody with WBSU here, then you'll get 2.6 instead of 2.5 or instead of 2.4. If you want to be in the picture and you allow me to post it to my Facebook page. And then for those of you who don't have WBSU here on, if anybody wants to get a little bit of extra credit, I can use somebody to take that picture for us. All right? Any questions? All right. I'm just trying to get free publicity for, uh, for the university. Anyway, so there's no questions about the syllabus. Okay, make sure you guys read it if you haven't read it yet. I have a feeling only two of you have read it completely. Um, don't know, don't ask how I know that. It's just that's just my feeling. Anyway, read the syllabus. Let's get started. Biology. This first chapter is really going to talk about what biology is about. As far as the exam is concerned, it's not that important. It's more of an introduction into the entire semester. So, first of all, what do you guys think biology is? Can someone tell me what biology is. What are we learning this semester? Yeah. Study of life. Good. Anybody else? I'm mean, you're correct, but are there That's any other? Scientific study. Yep, the scientific study of Only life. because he corrected me. Yeah. That's all my words. And we will talk about that. And that also brings up a good point, too. Make sure you read your textbooks before you come in. My job here is to explain to you what's in the textbook because it's a 100 level course. So, um, you know, you should read it. I should come in, explain what you've already read. And that way you're just kind of checking mentally. Like, did he explain the, the way I thought I understood it? And then, if there's parts where you didn't understand it, you can raise your hand and say, hey, I didn't understand that. So make sure you read beforehand. And if you read beforehand and remembered it, you would also remember that it is the scientific study of life. And I'll get into that here in a second. But any guess is why we would even make that distinction. Why I call it the scientific study of life as opposed to just the study of life. Yes? Um, some people's like the evolution and stuff like that can also be Good point. She said in the book that basically there's other ways of studying life. And this is all stuff we're about to talk about here in a second. There'll be PowerPoints for it so you can take notes. But yeah, there are other ways of studying life. Uh, for example, history. Right? History is the way of studying the lives that have occurred before us, right? There's other ways of studying life. 
But let's talk about some stuff before we jump into the actual book. And the book doesn't talk about too much, and I want to make it very important. I know the answer to this already, but I'll ask it again. How many of you are biology majors? None, right? So you might be wondering, why do I have to take classes that are not in my major? So why is that? Not just biology specifically, but why do you think it's useful for you to take classes that are not in your major? Any guesses? All right, what's a degree for, generally speaking? How about that? What do you think getting a college degree is used for? Or what's the purpose of it? How do you want to put it? Get a job, right? That's the number one answer I usually get. Anybody else? Educate yourself. Educate yourself, good. I like all of those. Educate others. Educate others, yep. Anybody else? I think the whole get a job thing is the number one answer people usually get. That's always what I would do, I think, when you get a chance. Um, that was always the number one answer I get, or not answer. That's what I was always told growing up. So you gotta go to college so you can get a job. But in my opinion, it's much bigger than that. Because you can definitely get a job without going to college. Especially depending on what your major is, you can probably get a better job not going to college, right? You go to trade school or something like that, you get a better paying job with more job security, things like that, less, uh, less student debt. But it's not all about getting a job. In my opinion, the idea, the purpose of a bachelor's degree, any college degree, is to give you a well-rounded education so you're a better informed citizen, right? A citizen of this, this country, citizen of the world. So you're making informed decisions when you vote, informed decisions when you buy things, informed decisions when you sit on a jury, right? These are all important things. And what I've seen recently, especially recently, is people lack the ability of critical thinking. And they just don't know stuff. It's okay to be dumb because you haven't learned it. But if you're dumb just because you're blocking out information, that's even worse. So anyway, in my opinion, that's the big thing about a bachelor's degree. Forget getting a job. I mean, yes, that's obviously important. We all need jobs. But you need to be more well-informed. And if it's done properly, um, a college degree should help you become a critical thinker, right? And be able to think about things, not just what's in your major. Especially in biology, biology is a great example. When it comes time to vote, and someone's trying to convince you that this party did this thing with COVID, and this party did that thing with COVID. And then to make that argument, they're telling you things about COVID, some of which is going to be true, some of it's not. To truly understand COVID, the, uh, the disease and the virus that causes it, you need to know a little bit of basic biology, right? Just things like that. Um, climate change, that's things that affect how you might vote. To truly understand climate change and how it impacts the world, then you need to understand biology. And then, of course, there's just the regular stuff, like I said on Monday. You, know, you might get diagnosed with a disease. And now all of a sudden, or your loved one gets diagnosed with a specific type of cancer. And now you need to learn about it. Well, because of this class, you're not starting from the ground level, right? You're getting a good foundation. Does that make sense? Any questions? All right. Obviously, you're not going to get tested on what biology is about. But that is, before I jump into this, one last thing to say about independent work. That's a good little paper you could write about for independent work. It be really short, it be really long. You could write about why do you think biology is specifically important. Of course, you could relist the things I said, and then you could do something specific to you. And I mentioned on Monday, like you know, again, if you're a student athlete, you might be interested in how uh, how how you gain weight, how you gain muscle, or how you lose weight with fat, how you become stronger, how you become faster, all those things. Just think of something specific to you. Why is biology important to you? And of course, that's just an option. You don't have to write that if you don't want, but just an idea. So, any questions before we jump into the textbook? All right, here we go. A lot of this stuff I've already covered without the PowerPoint, so we can kind of roll through it. Why biology matters. Every chapter of your um, textbook starts with this, and they have a few pictures, and they say why this chapter matters, and of course this chapter is the introduction to the entire book, so this chapter says why biology matters. Um, and it's been a while since I actually read it, so I don't know if I remember this correctly or not, but can anybody tell me what this is? I mean, you can think about it. Oh, it's, don't, don't make it too hard. What is that thing right there? It's a bird. Yeah, it's a bird, right? But do you know what specifically what species it is? Don't worry, I don't need it. But you know it's a bird, right? You know it's a bird. Have you ever seen that bird before? Anybody? I have not. I assume you have. Well, I have because I've taught this class, but prior to that, I have not. But yet, without ever seeing that bird before, you know what it is. You know it's a bird, right? That's just part of biology. That's part of taxonomy. We just have certain rules in biology where, you know, this thing is that kind of species, or this thing is that kind of animal, this thing is that kind of plant, and you just kind of know because of rules of biology, 
And I, if I remember correctly, that's what your textbook was good to get. Um, taxonomy. And we're going to learn about that later in the semester. Um, anybody know what that thing is? It's a little bit hard to see. It's fuzzy. But any guesses of what that is? It's an actual picture, I think. That's OK. It's hard to tell. That is a rover on Mars. Any idea? Well, it's probably doing a lot of things. But can anybody guess what that thing is doing that's relevant to this class? That's okay. A lot of things, one of which, though, it's probably looking for water. Signs of water that's there now, or signs of water that used to be there. Reason being because if there's water, there's a possibility there may be life. And of course, biology is the scientific study of life. So that's relevant to this course because, hey, it's looking for life. And that's what biologists do. They look for it, they find it, they study it. Um, any idea? You guys can see what this guy's doing, right? Can you see? What's he doing? Yeah, he's fixing the wheel on his bicycle. If I remember correctly, and uh, maybe it's been a while since I've read this portion of the textbook because it's not that important, but if I remember correctly, your book is getting at the fact that that dude right there is doing the scientific method. He's not thinking about it, probably. He's not like, all right, I'm going to fix this wheel. Step one is observation. Step two is uh, question, right? He's not going through the scientific method in his head, but he is actually doing it without knowing it. And that's something we're going to talk about in this chapter. You're going to learn about the scientific method and how it is important and how you're probably already doing it without even realizing it. So anyway, that's just the introduction to the uh, chapter. A lot of times I'll actually skip that, um, depending on how far or ahead we are in the course. Any questions about this slide? All right, let's move forward. Why does biology matter to you? I'm going to go ahead and skip across, skip over this slide because we've already talked about it. There's a lot of reasons why biology might matter to you. Obviously, I think right now the biggest one that's most relevant and it's most in our face would be COVID-19, right? We're all dealing with it a little bit less than we used to, um, used to be, but it's still something that we deal with. But yeah, there's a list of other things. And those are just things that I either got out of the textbook and or I came up with myself. But you could, there's just so many things you can come up with. If it has to do with life, scientific study of life, then, you know, it's about. Any questions about that slide? Right. And obviously, I'm not going to test you on why biology matters to you. Um, every chapter of your textbook has a chapter thread. Um, in this first chapter, the chapter thread is sea turtles. So they talk about a bunch of things and they always relate it to sea turtles. That's not important. I just wanted to point that out so you understand, like, why does it keep talking about sea turtles? It's because I teach out of the textbook in your chapter one is talking about sea turtles. So it's not that sea turtles are particularly important for this chapter in this course. It's just that's the theme of this chapter from your textbook. All right, here we go. Now the meat and potatoes, the important stuff. Chapter one is broken down into three main points. First of all, we're going to talk about the scientific study of life. Then we're going to talk about the properties of life. And then we're going to talk about the major themes in biology. And again, as far as the exam is concerned, this is one of the most unimportant chapters. This is just an introduction trying to ease you into the rest of the semester. But you guys don't need to write those down either, sorry. Because we're going to talk a lot about the scientific study of life. That's going to break down to a whole discussion. The second bullet point will break down under the whole discussion. And so, yeah, so those are the three main things we're going to talk about in this chapter. And again, no need to write that down. As I already asked you, I said, how do you define biology? Somebody said, but someone said the, the study of life, that was correct. And someone said the scientific study of life, that was more correct. In this book, excuse me, in this course, we define it as the scientific study of life. Make sure you write that down. Don't confuse it with the study of life. And you know, maybe if you were to take somebody else, even in this building, if you were to take biology with somebody else, they might accept that as a correct answer. The study of life, that's correct. But in this course, we're going to be more specific and say the scientific study of life. So then that brings up two questions. Well, I guess three. If it's a scientific study of life, we're saying it is the scientific study of life. And that brings up the question, well, what in the world is a scientific study? What makes that different than other things? And there's no need to write that down because we're going to talk about it here in a second. The other question would be, okay, if it's a scientific study of life, then what is life, right? And we're going to talk about that here in a second, so there's no need to write that down yet. And of course, as we've already briefly discussed, and it's not really important for the, for the exam, how else can you study life? So all these three things we're going to talk about here in a second. But are there any questions so far? All right, so the first thing we're going to talk about under this main idea of the scientific study of life is an overview of the process of science, i.e. the scientific method. Before we jump into that, I want to say this. 
If you were to Google the scientific method versus reading this textbook, versus reading a different textbook, versus asking a different professor in this room or this building, you might get a slightly different answer of what the scientific method is. So before we jump into this, just know that your book is the ultimate source as far as grading is concerned. As far as how we're going to run things in this course, your book, how it says the scientific method works, that's what we're going to go with. Does that make sense? Because it is slightly different. It's not a strict way of doing things. It's an overall guideline. So your book says we're going to do it one way. That's what we're going to do. That's how you're going to get tested. So that being said, let's talk about it. The overall, or excuse me, an overview of the process of science. Scientific investigations, as we said earlier, are not the only ways of knowing nature. There's no need to write this down. This is just a point that I was trying to make earlier. What are the other ways that we can study life? Religion, right? So if I were to say, what is the meaning of life? Probably not going to crack open your uh, biology textbook, right? Nowhere in that book does he even pretend to tell you what the meaning of life is. You might get that in religion or philosophy, right? But you're not going to get it in biology. History, as I've said, that's another way of studying life. That's a way of studying the lives that have come before us that have led us to where we are right now. Art, that's uh, sort of a way of, of uh, studying life. Others, I don't know, does anybody have any other ones off the top of your head? Another way of studying life? Not that you need to, I'm just curious. All right, there's another independent work idea for you if you want. What are some other ways of studying life? You can either just list, you can list it and then describe it, just defend your answer. Anyway, as I've also kind of hinted at earlier, a broad education should include exposure to all these different ways of viewing the world. So I love, I love that your textbook did that because you'll see throughout the semester, that's my big thing. So broad education, right? A bachelor's degree is not just learning how to do your job. I saw a meme yesterday, actually, that reminded me of this. Somebody said they were a, actually, I forgot what they meant. Oh, no, how did I forget? A biology major, actually one of my former students, said something about, like, why did I have to take a film appreciation course? Which breaks my heart, because that means the film appreciation professor probably just didn't, probably didn't make the right points. When I took film appreciation, my professor was like, look, I know it's fun. I know that films are fun to watch and it's entertainment, but sometimes it's an art form and there's more to it. Sometimes the director is trying to tell you something, right? They're trying to tell you something in a way that you can remember, right? Like, I'm not going to try to defend that class all my time. But point is, the idea for, the, for that one class is, you know, if the art is trying to, excuse me, the director is trying to prevent, uh, present some art, trying to tell you something, as a, as a voter, you should be able to understand what they're trying to say. Because usually there's a commentation on, a, or a comment, excuse me, I didn't have my coffee today. Um, they're trying to talk about society today. That's basically what I'm getting at. Anyway, broad education, it's important. I need my coffee. Any questions about this slide, which is relatively unimportant in the grand scheme of the, uh, the exam? All right, moving forward. Chapter one goes by really quickly, as you can tell. So, and what is the difference between science and other ways of trying to make sense of nature? Any guesses? Obviously, we're about to talk about it, but can anybody take some guesses as what's, to what the difference is between the scientific study of life versus others? Proven? I like that. Um, and we'll talk about that throughout the semester. A lot of times that word proven is used a lot, even among scientists. And I like that you said that. I personally don't like the word proof. Um, and you'll see why. We don't talk about it too much in this class, but when you get to, into things like statistics, Technically, it's not necessarily proving, it's just like saying it's really, 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 really highly probable. And we'll get into that throughout the semester, so I'm glad you said that. But yeah, you're proving things with science as opposed to just speculating. But how do we prove things or prove things? What is it that we do in science that's different than other things that makes it proof? Experiments, good. Science involves experiments, good. Anything else? Actually, everything else I'm thinking about kind of falls under under experiments. So we'll just move forward if no one else has any guesses. All right. Science. First of all, you do need to know this. Science is the approach to understanding the natural world based on inquiry. That's from your textbook. I might ask it that way. There's probably another way I'll ask it. When I bring it up and put it on the, on the board, I'll tell you. But yeah, it's an approach to understanding the natural world based on inquiry. And to me, I focus on this part, the based on inquiry part. To me, that's the most important. 
And I'm not here to tell you that science is better at understanding life than the other ways of understanding of studying it. But one of the ways that makes it different is again that based on inquiry. But if you're looking at it maybe from a religious point of view, you're not basing it on inquiry, you're basing it on, you know, maybe what your holy text says, whatever your religion might be. You're not asking questions necessarily. You, just, you do, but you just go find the answer, and that's the end of it, right? Like she said, with science, you have to do experience. So anyway, yeah, know that. Science is also the search for information, which, you know, does not necessarily make it unique yet. So is religion, right? You're looking for information. So usually in your text, your, your holy, holy book, whatever it may be. Or history, right? If you're an archaeologist, you're looking for artifacts. That's a search for information. It's a search for explanations. So again, nothing new there, nothing unique there. Same thing with religion, same thing with history. And again, um, it's a search for answers to specific questions. Again, does not make it specific. So if you're writing things down, I would say the most important thing is this big bullet point. These are the three little bullet points are kind of auxiliary. A little bit less important. So what do scientists do? Scientists seek natural causes. There's no need to write this down, I don't think. Scientists focus on processes. Wait, 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 let me back up. Scientists seek natural causes. Let's talk about that for a second. And again, I'm not here to tell you biology is better than any other way of understanding the world. But I'm talking about how it's different. Right? So scientists seek natural causes. So you know, if an earthquake hits San Francisco, a scientist, usually probably a geologist, is going to figure out what is the natural cause, right? What fault line slipped to make that earthquake happen? Somebody else, like maybe a religious fanatic, might say, instead of seeking a natural cause, and again, I'm not saying right or wrong, but they're, when they seek the cause, they might say, what did San Francisco do to piss off God? Or, or the gods, whatever their religion may be, right? So that would be seeking not natural causes. I'm not saying it's wrong, I'm just saying it's different. So scientists seek natural causes. Scientists focus on processes and structures. And I might come back to that. So that'll make a little bit more sense a little bit later. Basically, things that we can measure, right? So maybe the earthquake, maybe the earthquake in this hypothetical earthquake in San Francisco, maybe it was caused because God was angry at San Francisco. I don't know. But that's nothing that a biologist or a scientist could, could study because there's nothing they can measure, right? Unless they can somehow have a discussion with God and, I don't know, somehow quantify that discussion. There's nothing to measure. So, again, scientists focus on processes and structures. When I say, as I was kind of hinting at earlier, when we talk about processes and structures, those things must be verifiably observed and measured. I have any glitch here? I am. Fantastic. Okay. There we go. Anyway, yes. So when we're talking about processes and structures, those are things that have to be observed and measured. And this, I'm going to talk about this here a little bit later in the chapter two, but really quickly, I'll give an example that I'm going to talk about. Again, use this example later. But, you know, if we were to say, you know, does everybody know what Mex Mexichonis is? That's what we call it. The, uh, I don't remember the real name, Los Agaves down the road. If someone were to say, Los Agaves has the best margaritas in town, that is something that a scientist couldn't really study, you can get a people's opinions and quantify that, but that's still just opinions. That's nothing you could verifiably observe or measure, right? Because it's opinions. But if I were to tell you Los Cabes is 3.2 miles from here, that is something that we can measure, right? We can get in our car, hit the odometer and measure, right? Or get on Google Earth. So yeah, again, scientists, natural causes, processes, structures, things that we can measure, things that we can observe. And again, I want to point out, I'm not saying that the other way of trying to figure things out is more or is wrong. I'm just saying this is what makes science different. Any questions so far? It's pretty simple so far, right? Probably stuff you already knew. All right, now we're going to talk about the actual scientific process, the scientific method. And again, like I said, it's going to be different if you look it up in a different source or read a different textbook or talk to a different professor. But I teach out of this textbook, so this is the way you need to understand it. So know it this way for the exam, but also know if you're just, for some reason, talking about the scientific method to somebody out on the streets, and they tell you something that doesn't sound like, and you don't, don't be like, that's not the way we learned it in Mr. Dean Ellis' class, you're wrong. Don't be like that. This is just the way I'm teaching it. It's not set in stone, this is just a, an overall guideline. 
All right, step one, exploration. So you definitely want to write this down. Maybe you're just the number one, and then the word exploration slash observation. Because sometimes you are specifically doing exploration, like a scientist might be out looking for things, right? So for them, that would be step one, right? They are they're studying those turtles that I showed you earlier, the sea turtles. Or most likely for you guys, since you're not scientists, your first step is just going to be observation. You're just... So I observe as I'm cutting my grass in my yard, the grass under my big tree looks different than the grass in the big open spot in my yard, right? That's an observation. I notice, I just observe that it's different types of grass, as an example. Now, if we're going back to the idea of exploration, which is what scientists would do as opposed to just regular people like us, they are exploring. So again, using the sea turtles example, they're observing them. They're taking data. So they're recording their observations. And they're looking for, and that is, excuse me, that data is the evidence on which scientific inquiry is based. But as far as taking notes is concerned, I think the most important thing that you need to write down for this is number one, is exploration slash observation. So know that that's step one, and also know what it means. So on the exam, you will probably have one question where you need to put them in order, right? You probably have another question where I say, I give you an example. So I might say, the scientist was studying the chimpanzees. Which step was that? And that would be the exploration, right, step one. So I'll give you an example of step one, and you need to recognize it as step one as opposed to the other ones. And there's going to be a question where I ask you to put them in order. So that brings us to the next step. Again, using my example, I'm cutting the grass. I notice that the grass under my big tree seems to be different than the grass in other parts of my yard. So that leads me to what? And I know it's up there, but what, come, what would come after that? If you saw, if you observed something that looked odd to you, then what would happen next in your brain? Question, Question right? In this case, in my example, like what in the world was going on there? Why is there a different grass here than there is there, or is there a different grass? I mean, am I just is it just uh, am I seeing things wrong? So yeah. So if you take notes, step two, question, and you'll notice in this class we don't. I, I try my best to stick with the scientific method as written, but sometimes we have to skip things. So when you think about it, a lot of times when we do a lab, it's going to start straight with step two. Right? Because you're not out observing things, I'm telling you something. You're going to come in and I'm going to say, all right, here's the question you're going to answer in this lab. Right? So in that case, we're going to skip step one and go straight to step two. Question. So what happens after a question? How about that? That was Yes, that was correct. But I was actually hoping to get to that in a second. But yes, that is the correct answer. But if it was a real life situation and we weren't talking about uh, the scientific process, if someone asks you a question, then what comes after that? If I were to ask her a question, then, then what happens? What's the next step after a question? An answer, right? And that's basically what the next step is. Of course, don't write that down because we don't call it the answer. Oops. Yeah, that's somebody exploring. The next step, step three, if you're writing it down, is hypothesis. But as someone already said, that is the answer. It's a little bit different than just the answer in general. It's a proposed explanation. It's a proposed answer, right? So again, you observe something, question it, and the hypothesis is like an, a, a tentative explanation of why you observe what you observe. A tentative answer to what you to the question you formulated. Now here's the important part: it has to be testable and falsifiable. So again, going back to my original um, example, you observe that there's an earthquake in San Francisco. You question what caused that earthquake in San Francisco. If your proposed explanation is that God was angry with San Francisco, again, I'm not saying that's wrong, but scientifically, that is not a hypothesis. Because there's no way to test that, right? You can't test that. And you certainly can't falsify it, right? So even if some other person does a scientific study and says, oh, look, we found, we found this fault line. We can see where it shifted. We even have some webcam videos of the thing happening. So we know this is what caused it, 
right? Somebody may be able to say that. And then the other person can say, well, God, God caused that to happen, right? And they can keep saying that because you cannot falsify that. And again, I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I'm just saying that's what makes it different than science. Science, you have to have it falsifiable. Bigfoot. A valid um, scientific hypothesis for Bigfoot would be, you could say Bigfoot exists in the Pacific Northwest. That is a valid scientific hypothesis because I could test that. I could go to the Pacific Northwest and I could try to collect data that, you know, proves what I say. Of course, I won't because as far as we know, they don't exist. But what's not a falsified or what's not a valid hypothesis is that Bigfoot does not exist, oddly enough. That is not a valid scientific hypothesis because I can't prove Bigfoot does not exist. I can give you a lot of evidence. I can say, look, I've been looking and looking and looking and haven't found any evidence, but that's not proof, right? That just means you can just say, well, you just haven't found it yet. Or maybe all the evidence is destroyed. So again, it's very important. A hypothesis has to be testable, has to be falsified. Please understand that. Because on the, again, on the exam, I'm gonna give you an example of something and you're gonna have to say, oh yeah, that's a hypothesis. And there'll be another question probably where I say, okay, here's two statements. Which one of these is a valid hypothesis? And they won't be crazy about Bigfoot. They'll be a little bit harder to understand because it's a test, right? But they'll understand if it's a hypothesis, a valid hypothesis, it has to be testable, it has to be falsified. That brings us to step four, experiment. Because as you formulate this hypothesis, actually, let me take that back. Sorry, if you wrote four in experiments, I apologize. Cross that out, erase it, do what you gotta do. But, Let's go back to the idea of hypothesis. So you have this hypothesis, this proposed explanation for an observation or a question. So then what you need to do, because of the fact that it's testable and falsifiable, then you need to set about testing it and seeing if you can falsify it. And that brings us to predictions. And a prediction, it's kind of like a very specific version of a hypothesis. And I'll give you some examples later, and maybe I'll do it now. Let's see. Yeah. All right, so again, going back to my yard as an example. Let's say there's a place in my yard, and I observe that my friends like to pee when I come over to hang out and drink beers on my back deck. They like to pee in that one corner of my backyard, I guess because it gives them a little bit of privacy. That's what I've observed, and I've observed that the grass is a lot better in that spot that they pee than other spots in my yard. Right? That's my observation, which leads me to the question, is urine good for grass, right? So then I form a hypothesis. Yes, urine is good for grass, right? Now, there's so many ways I could test that and try to falsify it. That's where the prediction comes from. <coughs> Predictions are basically restating your hypothesis, but in a specific way that kind of describes how you're going to test your hypothesis. And in a perfect world, you would have many predictions on your one hypothesis. For example, if my hypothesis is that urine is good for grass, then one prediction would be, if I got my friends to stop peeing in that spot of the grass and started peeing somewhere else, then the grass where they used to pee would not be as good anymore, and the grass where they're peeing now would be better. Does that make sense? That's a way I could test my hypothesis. And also notice I used an if-then statement. That's just one way. So let's say I do that experiment, which, by the way, is the next step. Let's say I do that experiment, and sure enough, it worked. I'm not done yet. I mean, yes, I've supported my hypothesis, but I haven't proved it. So then I come up with another, um, come up with another prediction. So I say, all right, if I get a set of plants and I give them the same amount of water at the same time every day, and they're in the same soil and get the same amount of sunlight. Um, Plant one gets zero urine, plant two gets 50% urine, plant three gets 75% urine, and plant four gets 100% urine. If I do all this and measure how long it, you know, how, how much they grow in six weeks, then I will find the plants that got the most urine grew better than the plants that got no urine. That's really long-winded. The prediction usually wouldn't be that long, but the point is, again, I just came up with two predictions off that one hypothesis. Make sense? Because, the first prediction I came up with in this hypothetical situation, we did it, it supported my hypothesis. All right, so now I'm going back to the back to the drawing board and I'm gonna to try to test it again. Because again, in science, you're trying to falsify it. You come up with a hypothesis and then your job is to actually try to prove it wrong. 
do everything you can to try to prove your own hypothesis wrong. And then at the end of the day, once you've done as many experiments as you can to prove your hypothesis wrong, if you never could prove it wrong, then probably it is correct. So anyway, yes. Step one, observation. Step two, question. Step three, hypothesis. Step four, prediction. Step five, experiment. And of course, we're going to talk all about experiments. We're going to do them every week in that. Um, an experiment is sometimes a scientific test. Like I mentioned on that second prediction where I was like, all right, plant one gets 0% urine, plant two gets 50% urine, blah, blah, blah. That would be an actual scientific test, right? Versus the first prediction that I made would be more like observations, right? In that case, I would say, all right, I'm going to get into it that later. We'll get into it later. For now, just know that it goes observation, question, hypothesis, prediction, experiment. Any questions about that? Again, know them in order and be able to, to recognize when I give you an example. All right. As I would say one of the most missed questions is that the difference between a hypothesis and a prediction. Yes? Are we allowed to do independent work during the science? Yes, that's a great question. That's a great question. So, what you could do is the whole scientific method. Where, like, basically an experiment, like you observe something, you write about. It. I observed this, which led me to question this. Here's my hypothesis. Here's my predictions to test my hypothesis, and then you can do the experiments. You could do that. Before you do that, though, make sure you talk to me because we'll have to figure out the point value because that's more than just writing, right? Because then you're actually doing stuff too, so it should be worth more. But that being said, is the fun part. I think you don't even have to do the experiment portion. What we could do is the scientific method of just writing it down, because even that's important, right? Coming up with, you know, after observing something, coming up with a question, coming up with a hypothesis, and then coming up with ways to test it, right? The predictions. Even though you might not do the experiments, just to be able to think of the different ways that you could test your hypothesis and try to falsify it. Even that in itself is a great scientific uh, experiment, but activity. So yeah, it's a great question. Any other questions? All right. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about experiments, a.k.a. testing. Your book gives a decent example. Anybody know what that thing is? Earth to wrong control. Correct. So here's a decent ex example of how you might use the scientific process in your everyday life without even thinking about it. So in this case, it doesn't really, they wrote exp exploration, but again, most non-scientists aren't technically exploring. Usually for us, the first step is observation, right? So again, exploration slash observation. In this case, the observation is, hey, when I hit the power button, the TV doesn't come on. That's the observation, which leads to a question. And I don't know why they don't have this on there. But if you were to do that, if you were to click that, then the question would be, why doesn't it work, right? Why didn't the TV turn on? That's the question. So then that brings you to the hypothesis. And the one that they're using is the remote's batteries are dead. So that's a hypothesis. Try to turn the TV on. The TV won't turn on. So the hypothesis is the remote's batteries are dead. What are some other hypotheses you could come up with for that situation? Again, you're sitting on your couch, you hit the power button, the TV doesn't come on. What are some other observations? Yeah. You said the TV's broken. TV's broken. That's a good one. That's a hypothesis. What else? Range? Oh, the range of the remote. Yeah. What else? The angle. The angle? Mm -hmm. like, Sometimes you like, oh, yeah. Like how you're pointing at it? Yeah. Good. That's another hypothesis. Any, any other ones? I mean, there's a million of them. Maybe, maybe you're just really unobservant and the power's out in your house. Right? You just didn't notice. You just popped out on your couch and did that. There's so many things it could be. Or maybe the maybe it's not the remote's broken or the, uh, the batteries are dead on the remote. Maybe the remote's broken. Maybe your kid dropped it again like he does with the fire safety boat, and it's eventually going to break. That's a real life example of my house. So yeah, but anyway, of all the hypotheses, your book shows us the remotes, batteries are dead. So what comes next? The prediction. And again, there's different ways to test your hypothesis, but your book just shows this one. If I replace the batteries, the batteries will work, right? Um, for that, for that, I guess for that hypothesis, that's one of the few 
There's not many predictions you could do to test that out, but this is, but yeah, that fireplace, the batteries, uh, the remote will work. Then comes your experiment. And of course, as you're doing this in your brain, you're not thinking step one, I, you know, uh, for first comes the prediction, then I'm gonna do the experiment. You're not thinking that, you're just doing it naturally. So you say, all right, if I replace the batteries, the remote will work. So what do you do? You replace the batteries with new ones. And then what happens, let's say you hit the power button and it works. Your experiment supports the hypothesis. Here's where it gets a little bit wonky in my opinion. This is correct. And the real scientific method, when you test your hypothesis, when you test your prediction with an experiment, even if it is correct, then you go back to the drop board, or the, back to the uh, back to the board and come up with a new prediction and test that, right? You keep going, keep going, test all the different predictions because you're trying to falsify your hypothesis. All the reason I don't like this in this example is because in real life, with the remote situation, that's not what you're gonna do, right? If you replace the batteries and your remote works, you're just done. You're not gonna be like, oh, well, I, I supported my hypothesis, let me test it again. No, you're not gonna do that. You're gonna go watch the last season of uh, Better Call Saul. That's all you were trying to do anyway. You got it working, then you're done. But yes, in real life, like I said earlier, you keep doing experiments and coming up with new predictions, all these different ways to test your hypothesis. And of course, if you do the experiment and it does not support your hypothesis, then you're kind of starting over again, right? You're going to come up with a new hypothesis. You're going to revise your hypothesis. Does all that make sense? I hope so. Because again, there'll be an example like this on the exam, except it won't be the remote. It might be like a car not starting or something like that. OK. I'm not right. I'm not going to go over this. I put this on the PowerPoint so you can read it yourself. I tried to give you an example of one hypothesis, right? And then all a bunch of a bunch of different predictions you can make based on that one hypothesis to keep testing it and keep trying to falsify it. So read that on your own. Um, it's just an example. You're not going to get tested on it. It's not even from the textbook or something I came up with. All right, here's a here's the next part. And I hate to say this, but as far as a weird concern in this course, this next part is a little bit less important. In the grand scheme of real science and real scientific studies, this is important because scientists aren't just out there doing studies. For their own sake and they're just doing it and they don't tell anybody right they publish their findings and that's what we're, about, what we're about to talk about but you guys not being biology majors you're probably not going to publish your findings of the battery work on my remote control once i change it but as much as this isn't very relevant to you it is slightly relevant so before a scientific study can be published in a scientific journal the research has to be evaluated by qualified impartial and often anonymous experts not involved in the study. No need to write all this down, I don't necessarily think. I'm just trying to tell you basically how a peer reviewed journal works and why it's important. Um, yeah, so again, before something gets published, it's not like a scientist just turns something in and then the publisher's like, yep, that looks good, let's publish it, right? They go through it. A bunch of people go through it. I'm like, does that look right? Does it look like that is actually the correct information? Um, it's basically quality control. So peer review is not perfect, but it's a lot better than YouTube. So if you find something in a peer review journal that says, we did this experiment and we found this, then that is very reliable. A lot more reliable than, again, like using YouTube for, for an example. Some people, you can say anything on the internet. There is no quality control. Peer review is not perfect. There have been some things that have slipped through the crack. But again, you know, YouTube, I keep using that as an example, has no peer review. I can go out there and say anything. And especially me, I know enough about biology, I can make it sound feasible to people who don't know enough about biology. I could say a bunch of I could say a bunch of true things. I could say this is true, this is true, and they could all be true, just to build up to a big lie. Does that make sense? It's dangerous. People could do that, and they do do that. I could tell you a bunch of true things to where if you were to look up all those little statements, they would be true. But the overall thing that I'm getting at, building at, could be a lie. So be careful with that. This is why peer review journals are so important. And also, like when you read things on the news, that's usually where you guys will probably read scientific journals. Somebody in the news cycle found this peer-reviewed journal and tried to explain it in layman's terms, which oftentimes works. But sometimes it doesn't because they don't understand it and they misrepresent it. So anyway, this slide is very unimportant for the exam. But it's very important for your everyday life. Just know, if you really want to know the truth, you need to get to the source and hopefully the source is peer reviewed. Anyway, any questions about that slide? 
Uh, this is also a very unimportant slide as far as the exam is concerned. This is just a discussion. Much scientific research is focused on solving problems, right? Usually scientists, they're trying to solve a problem. It's usually not just them doing experiments for the sake of doing experiments, which makes sense because usually they take a lot of money. And to get that money, they have to get grants from places like the government. And to do that, they have to write an explanation of why it's going to cost this much and how this information is going to be useful to society. So yeah. Uh, that's why this slide's getting at. Um, yeah, that's it. Any questions about this slide? We do have time to talk about this. This might be the last thing we talk about. So I've used these words, or I've used this word, hypothesis, but then there's things called theories and facts. These three words are related, but they're different. And it's important to understand the difference in the relationship between these words. Very, very important. A theory, you need to know what a theory is. It is a comprehensive, well substantiated explanation. And here's the important part I put it in bold because the question on the exam is going to be less asking you what a theory is and more asking you to differentiate between a theory and a hypothesis. So a theory is broader in scope than a hypothesis. And I'll give you some examples later. Another way of saying this is. Hypotheses are much more specific theories. In a loose way, it's almost the same as the, the relationship between a hypothesis and a prediction, right? A, a hypothesis and that relationship is pretty broad. And then you come up with all these different specific predictions to test that relatively broad hypothesis. In the theory, just taking that up a step, theory is very broad. So as far as the exam is concerned, the part of the bold is important. As far as everyday life is concerned and the usage of the word theory, I would say this is the most important part. A theory is a well-substantiated explanation. So when people say it's just a theory, that's a ridiculous thing to say, actually. So what they probably mean to say is it's just a hypothesis, which would be a little bit less ridiculous. By the time something is considered a theory, generally speaking, it's a pretty big deal. Right? It's pretty well set in stone. Not always, but generally speaking, if it's by the time the scientific community calls it a theory, that means it's pretty, uh, pretty substantiated. Because it's only accepted if it's supported by a large, very growing body of evidence. Right? So a lot of times hypotheses, they've been substantiated by one scientist who did a, you know, did, did a few experiments with different predictions. But a theory, on the other hand, has a wide, large, very growing body of evidence. I'm going to give you some examples a little bit later. A theory is used to explain many observations and devise new and testable hypotheses. So again, this is broader. Again, this is building this idea that theories are broader in scope than hypotheses. And like any other scientific idea, theories must be refined or abandoned if new contradictory evidence is discovered. There's a paper you could write about for independent work. Make it long, make it short. But what are some theories that have been abandoned as scientific body or evidence changed? We have had some theories where we're like, oh yeah, we know that's not true anymore. So anyway, for the exam, if you take notes, really the most important thing you need to know on this slide for the exam is that theory is broader in scope than hypothesis. Any questions about this slide? Okay. Yes. That's step four, right? Oh, great question. So uh, I should have said that. That's my, my fault. We're done technically talking about the, the scientific method in the steps, right? So we're done talking about step one, observation, step two, question, step three, hypothesis, step four, um, predictions, step five, experiment. We're done talking about that. Now we're just kind of like, we're done with that discussion. Now we're talking about this idea of the relationship between the word theory, the word hypothesis, and the word Facts. So I'm so glad you asked. We're done talking about strictly the steps in the science. Yes? Um, is conclusion anywhere at the end of the scientific method? Yeah, depending on how you look it up. So this book calls it the communication step. Right? That step where they showed you those people in front of the, the board, that would be their conclusion. And it's also slightly different. Um, when we do when you do your lab exam, your lab report, for example, there will be a conclusion. 
and it's not going to be called a conclusion, it'll be called a discussion, but it's essentially the same thing. So we'll cross that bridge when we get there. For the exam, for the exam, you can just drop that idea from your mind. For the exam, just to simplify things, because again, that's a one hundred percent course. Great question, and we will discuss that moving forward. For the exam, you don't have to worry about it. Yeah. So I guess when we come back, we'll give an example of this kind of relationship between hypotheses and theories. All right. So we do have time. Does anybody want? Actually, does anybody want to take the picture? The extra, a little bit extra credit. You know, you got, you everybody, everybody can leave. It's 8.50 now. You might want to take the WBSU picture. He, he volunteered first, so he can take the picture. And then anybody who wants to be in the picture with the WBSU gear, come on up front, please. I guess we should stand over here so we're not back with it. Oh, yeah, maybe over here. Point of mind for this little swap. There we go. Got us all? Yeah, I'm staying with you. Okay, thank you. All right, guys. Um, for those of you who did take the picture, if you don't mind sending me an email, just remind me you were in the picture. That way I can send you the picture and I give you your little extra code. Oh yes, lab is definitely today, every Wednesday at noon. Make sure you're here at noon, get on Google Classroom and read the lab before you come in. Yes, let me think about it, and I'll email me, I know you just told me, but email me so we have a paper trail, and we'll, and we'll figure it out. Right, yeah, thank you. All right, have a good one. No, that's okay. I know what you're going to say. So send me an email and tell me. Yeah, tell me that you know that, and I'll send you an email back explaining how it works. But I will say this: don't tell anybody about it. Yeah. <laughs>